the cold. Actually, you had it pretty good. Scott had to dig for two hours yesterday in Nashville. What did you guys get, 10 inches? In order to get his car to a passable part of a street. So he has gone the extra mile to be here with us. For those of you who don't know, Scott Sager is Vice President of Church Relations at Lipscomb University. He's also now the part-time preaching minister at the Granny White Church of Christ. Um, if you're new, Scott really helped us out about a year or so ago. He was interim preacher for us for four or five months. Just really, really, really helped us through that critical time. And we are still grateful uh, for his work with us during that. And so I won't take any more of his time. Scott Sager. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Oh, Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And as uh, the wise man Solomon reminds us that uh, there is a time for every season under heaven. And there is a time to be born and a time to die, a time to celebrate, a time to mourn, a time to build and a time to tear down. And Lord, Solomon says that you make everything beautiful in your time. And we look back over the last year and we're grateful for the friendship that you have allowed me to have with this uh, wonderful congregation. We're thankful as we look back over uh, the last year or so of the journey that we've taken together and the way that you have been faithful. And we're so thankful for uh, the way that you have brought Jody and his family here. Lord, it delights me, as you know, to hear the good news about uh, the great things that are happening here. And Lord, we pray a blessing upon uh, our time together today, uh, that we might uh, have a fruitful time in your word, that we might be a blessing to one another, and that uh, we might have fun as we think about the most important investment uh, that we have, and that is how to invest our life. And we ask that you would bless our time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have friends who keep a television in their office at Lipscomb, and they asked, do you want a television in your office, Scott? And I was like, I already can't get everything done I'm supposed to get done. Why would I want a television in my office? But the people who do have one are constantly telling me what the Dow is doing, as if I have a lot of money invested in the Dow anyway, you know? And I'm like, you know, the Dow, okay, great. But some of you watch the television to see what the Dow is doing because it's important to your life because you've got a lot of investments there and you'd like to see the arrow going up rather than going down. And so this morning I want to play off of that and I want to remind you that God has an investment and that investment is in us. And God wants to know, are you growing his investment that he's made in you? Is it flatlined? Or is it diminishing? And have you given much thought to how you invest your life? I am the vice president at uh, Lipscomb that works with church relations. And every so often, uh, a challenge will come. And a few years ago, we actually had a student who passed away right before school started. And uh, this doesn't happen at Lipscomb very often. We feel very blessed. But this student's name is Matt Deary, and I love to tell a story. Matt Deary came to us from Scranton, Pennsylvania, not Scranton, New Jersey, uh, for some of you who are thinking about that. And uh, he passed away on a, a back road there. But he was on our athletic team. He ran track. And he was an outstanding track uh, runner. He was so outstanding and such a leader that he was voted captain of the track team as a freshman. And one of the things that endeared people to Matt Deary was the way he celebrated and encouraged others. They told the story about how he put on a gorilla suit and went to a cross-country meet so that he could run around with, wearing a Lipscomb gorilla suit and cheer on his friends who were running the race. And so when he passed, one of the beautiful things Dr. Lowry always does is make sure that we attend funerals. And so if you're a faculty member and you lose a parent and the funeral's in Oregon, what you will do is you'll turn around at the funeral and you'll realize there's somebody from Lipscomb sitting there. 
And so Dr. Lowry asked me to uh, go to the funeral for Matt Deary. And we got there a day early, and we went to the memorial that they were having outside of the high school. And what we discovered is Matt was called Superman at the high school. He was the best athlete the school had ever had. And people were really taking it hard, his passing, because he was such a leader in the community. And at the end of the service, uh, one of the teachers came up to me and said, I know you know Matt, but you probably don't know him as well as I did. I was his English teacher. And he wrote a paper a few years ago, and I'd like for you to have a copy of it. And he wrote this paper, it's interesting, for Honors Algebra. And the title of the paper is Making Me Better. And it starts, the way to a bright future is through a positive career. The way to get that is through studying and doing well. Although you may not think you're doing well, there is always room for improvement. Ways that can help you to be better, identifying your strengths and your weaknesses. Using the information you have to grow your weaknesses and develop your strengths so that you can be a better student and a better person in general. And he goes on in the next few paragraphs to describe the things he is willing to do to make himself better. And it's no wonder that Matt made a positive influence on the world in his few years that he spent here because he lived his life intentionally. He knew who he was, he knew what he was about, and he knew what his plan was to make himself better. And so as we talk about how to invest your life today, I put a quote at the top of your handout, and it says, Everyone thinks about changing the world, but few of us think about changing ourselves. How about we be those who look at changing ourselves as the highest and greatest task? So I ask you this morning, how is it that you keep score? How do you keep score? How do you decide if your life is a win? How do you decide if the arrow is going up or down or is flat? How do you do that? <clears throat> Years ago, I went to Abilene Christian for uh, college, and they announced in chapel that there was going to be Special Olympics on campus. And so I noticed on Friday I didn't have a date, which probably doesn't surprise you guys. And uh, I was in the school cafeteria, and there wasn't anything good to eat, and that probably doesn't surprise you either. And so uh, I went and got in the cereal line, because you can always trust cereal uh, at any place. And by the way, let me add, Lipscomb has the best food of any college I've ever set foot on in America. I'm serious, okay? When you come visit, I'll take you there to eat. I eat there a lot because the food's really good. It's really good. But uh, Abilene, it wasn't so good. So I was in the cereal line, and there was a girl in front of me, and she was wearing a green basketball jersey. And I thought, oh, Special Olympics. So I asked her, um, how'd it go today? And she looked up at me, and she said, we lost, but I won. And I scratched my head, and I thought, basketball? Hmm. Say that again. She said, well, we lost, but I won. And I thought, this poor girl, somebody's going to make fun of her because she doesn't even understand basketball. So I said, well, basketball's a team sport, so either everyone wins or everyone loses. That's just the way it is with basketball. And she said, no, my coach said that even though we lost, I won because this is the first time I've played a whole basketball game and not lost my temper. Who felt like an idiot? <laughs> so I pulled my foot out of my mouth and said, oh, okay, you did lose but win. Now I understand. And that little girl, <clears throat> excuse me, she taught me how to keep score. Because the world actually has its scoreboard. And we want to do as well on the world scoreboard as we possibly can because it's part of our witness. So I want to be successful. I want to be intelligent. I want to do well in school. I want to be a good community member. I want to make an impact upon the world. The way the world keeps score is up here. But there's another scoreboard. And it's even higher up if you look up to see it. And it's the way that God keeps score. And at the end of the day, what you'll discover is this scoreboard, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, is rubbish. It's all passing away. And the real issue is, how are you doing on the upper scoreboard that really matters? And what you really want to do is to define what it is 
to have a win in your life. And I'm so delighted you guys are studying discipleship and the life of a disciple because the key question in your life, the key question of every disciple is this. Am I becoming more and more like Jesus every day? If you're doing a lot of other stuff and there's a lot of arrow pointing up in your life but you're not becoming more like Jesus and if you don't have a plan to become more like Jesus then at the end of the year, at the end of the decade, at the end of your life you're going to look back and say I spent way too much time keeping score on a scoreboard that's destined to perish. And so we as disciples think about a different scoreboard. How do you define a win? uh, Paul wrote to Timothy. I'm at the bottom of page one if you're kind of trying to follow along. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales, but train yourself to be what? To be godly. Physical training, I'd like to lose some weight, wouldn't you? That's the scoreboard that's here. Physical training has some value. Paul never said don't work out. But he said, but godliness has value both for this life and for the life to come. So train yourself to be godly. Do you have a personal trainer helping you be godly? Do you have a workout plan helping you to be godly? How do we train ourselves to be godly? Notice what Paul says when he writes to the Corinthians. And do we have any English teachers out here? Is there an English teacher in the room? Nobody? Nobody teaches English? Anybody teacher at all? Got any teachers? Okay, you're going to help me out. There's a word here I'm not sure about. So when I get to this word, can you call it out to me? Okay, here we go. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it in order to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I... What's that word? Buffet. Did you say buffet or buffet? Yeah. It's buffet. What does buffet mean? Buffet means I discipline my body. I'm rigorous about my body because I'm making it my slave in order that I can be disciplined to accomplish the goal I want to accomplish. And the problem with American Christianity is that we buffet our body rather than buffet our body. (laughs) Right? Yeah. We just basically say, whatever you do is great. You know? And whatever happens in your life, that's what your life is all about. And that's because we have substituted the key word of the New Testament, Christian, instead of the key word of the New Testament, disciple. And I bet Jody has said this already, or if he hasn't, I, maybe I'm stealing his thunder. But the word Christian, how many times in the New Testament? Three. So Jody did say this, right? There you go. Okay, good. So how many times disciple? Over 360 A disciple is a learner. A disciple is one who buffets his body. A disciple is one who has a rigorous workout plan to become godly, to become more like Jesus. And that's why the early church called the people who did that Christians. They're so about Christ. They're so rigorous about Christ. They're always about Christ that they just started calling them Christians. But they were the ones who were rigorous. They were disciples. And that's the challenge that we have as well. And so this morning I wanted to talk to you about a life investment plan. If you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to pick up in verse 14. And this is a story that perhaps you're quite familiar with. But let's take a fresh look at it this morning. And let's take a look at it like we are uh, business people. Like we've got our business hats on, like we're thinking about investment and investment strategies. And it says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. By the way, wasn't Jesus a great teacher? I mean, the way that he 
through his wisdom, could tell a story. And the Gospel of Matthew is Jesus telling five sets of great sermon stories. And so here we come, and he's got this illustration to make his point. And he says, it's like a man who goes on a journey who called his servant and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents. It's a sum of money. Let's say it's about... Uh, um, Let's say it's a couple of thousand bucks in today's money, okay? So let's say $10,000 for this guy, and to another he gave $4,000, and to another he gave $2,000. Then he went on his journey, and the man who had five talents went at once, put his money to work, and gained five more. Also the one who had two talents gained two more, but the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid the master's money. After a long time, the master of the servants returned and settled accounts with each of them. The man who had received the five brought the other five. Master, you entrusted me with five. I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. Now I'll put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents. Master, you entrusted me with two, and I've gained two more. His master said, Great job, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few, and I'll put you in charge of many things. Come, share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you haven't sown, gathering where you haven't scattered seed. I was afraid. So I went out, I put your talent in the ground, I buried it, and see, here it is. I brought back to you what you entrusted to me. And the master said, you wicked, lazy servant. You knew I harvest where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit in the bank. At least I would have returned and had interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For everyone who has will be given more and he will have and abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So let's look at this story for just a minute and let's see if there's some things in it that couldn't be an investment strategy for us as we're thinking about how to invest our life. And here's the first point that I want us to make. It's the principle of God's ownership. The principle of God's ownership. God is the man who's going on a journey, who calls his servants together and entrusts his property to them. I don't know if you spend much time in the Psalms, but if you haven't read Psalm 8 or Psalm 24 lately, uh, you might look at those. Psalm 24 says this, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. For he founded it upon the waters and he established it upon the seas. David tells us that God owns everything. Can you say that with me? God owns everything. Now look to the person next to you and tell to him like you really believe it, like you mean it. God owns everything. So God owns it all. And the first principle here is that God owns it all. So whose house is it? It's God's house. Whose car is it? It's God's car. Whose room is it? It's God's room. And when I taught this to my children, my daughter looked up at me and said, well, if it's God's room, he can clean it, right? And that gets us to another principle here in just a minute. But we do need to make sure that we understand that God owns everything. You're going to leave this earth and you're taking absolutely nothing with you because you don't own anything. And understanding that God owns it all is very important to understanding the way that a Christian life should function. God owns it all. The second principle, the principle of God's allotment. 
He gave some five to another two and to another one, each according to their present ability. Each one got something from God. God owns it all, and he gives some of it to you. It's like God is this rich father, and he has a family trust. And in this family trust, he has given some of it to you, and some of it to you, and some of it to you, some of it to you. It's all God's, and he's entrusted it to you. And you know what a wise father does? He entrusts it to you according to your ability to handle it. And so you might be like Tevia from the Fiddler on the Roof. Oh God, please smite me with riches, right? Give me more than I can handle. No, God doesn't work that way. God's going to give you what you demonstrate you can handle. And that's the principle that you are God's steward. You're God's steward. He's entrusting some of what is his to you according to your ability to handle it. And so some of us have been given talents. Some of us have been given time. Some of us have been given money and resources. We're a, a composite of a lot of different things, not just what our bank account has. Some of us can sing. And it really frustrates people like me who can't, you know. And some of us can draw and paint. And I can't do that either. Uh, we have all sorts of gifts that God has entrusted to us. According to our ability to use them. And so you're a steward of a portfolio that God designed for you. Number three, the principle of responsibility. Responsibility. After a long time, the master returned and settled accounts with each of the servants. Can you now look to the person next to you and say, I am responsible? Tell them, I am responsible. You know what? I have a portfolio, and I'm responsible for it. I am responsible. Now, a lot of us say, you know what? I don't keep up with my portfolio. I don't know anything about uh, how my money is being managed. Uh, I, I just trust Smith Barney, and they're off doing something. I don't even know. Well, that's not really very responsible, is it? Because it's your portfolio. And you're responsible for how it is used. And when it comes to your time, when it comes to your talents, when it comes to your treasure, you're responsible. You're responsible. Every one of us has the same amount of time in a day. How do we use it? Every one of us has talents on loan from God. How do we use them? God's dumped wealth upon us. Every one of us. Yeah, if we look around the world, we're all doing really, really well. We're responsible. And we don't get to say, well, no, God's not really looking at me. He's just concerned about the upper tax bracket, right? No. He wants to know, how are you doing with what's been given to you? God expects you to manage your portfolio well, to develop it, to make the most of what God has given to you. Like Matt Deary, to be asking the question, how can I make me better? How can I use the resources God's entrusted to me for the limited years I'm on this earth to do something wonderful? Any of you ever see the movie Schindler's List? The most touching scene in the whole movie is where he comes to the end and he gets to see the list. And by the way, I've been to Israel. If I ever get to go to Israel again, I'm going to invite this church to come with me. Is that all right? I think I'll be going again next year, but I took everybody to the Holocaust Museum, and Schindler's List is right there in the museum. You can see it. But he was so stricken, not with what he had done, but with how much more he could have done. And I wonder if that's not 
the attitude that most of us will have when our time on this earth comes toward an end is, I wish I had done more. Not to earn my salvation, but because God gave me so much and I wasn't as thoughtful as I could have been on how to use it well. So uh, I'm responsible, number four, the principle of accountability. God's going to hold you accountable. If you've done well, well done, good and faithful servant. Or you wicked and lazy servant. You will answer for how you perform. For what you do with what God has given to you. Now, is he a mean, strict judge that's looking for a reason to ding you? No. But he wants to know, have you been a good steward of the resources that were given to him? In Luke 19, 19 through 31, it's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And just as I was telling you about Schindler, here's a man who looks back over his life, the rich man, and wishes he had lived it differently. How many of you watch Scrooge during the Christmas holidays? Uh, the Charles Dickens story, I watch it every year just to remind me you know, that there's a ghost of my past, of my present, of my future. How am I doing with what God has given to me? And isn't it great to know, like Paul says in Timothy, forgetting what lies behind, I can press on today toward the goal of using what God has given to me well. So number five, here's the one where it gets really interesting, okay? God's investment strategy is this. You ready? Use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. And you know what? I'd be the same way. If I had a lot of money, even if I have a little bit of money, I have some money invested in the stock market, and there's a guy in Dallas that manages it for me, and I pick up the phone about four times a year, and I say, how we doing? And is it... Uh, is everything uh, allotted the way that you would like it? But you know what I want to know from him? I want to know that what I have given to him to invest for me is growing. If it's not, over a course of time, you know what I'm going to do? As much as I love him, seriously. I'm going to say, I love you, we're good friends, but for three years in a row... I haven't made anything on this investment. So I'm going to take it from you and give it to somebody else who can grow it. And I'm sorry, but that's the way life works. And what's God saying here? If you don't use what God has entrusted to you, he's going to take it and give it to somebody else. If you use what God has given to you well, what does he say? Oh, good. You've been faithful with a little. Now I'm ready to give you more. And here's the secret. Ready? Most of us are sitting here thinking, if I had more, then I'd be generous. If I had more, I'd be generous. And you know what Jesus would say to us? Hogwash. You've got everything you need to be generous right now. And what he wants to know is, will you invest it generously and see what kind of a reward comes? And that's where the rubber meets the road on this story for most of us. Is that we, we're afraid to be generous with our time. We're afraid to be generous with our gifts. We're afraid to be generous with our finances. And we keep saying, well, if we just had a little bit more, then I'd be generous. And here's what I've discovered. The most generous people I know never, ever, ever go broke. Because you cannot outgive God. You just can't do it. Read Ephesians chapter 3, and it says, I pray that out of the glorious 
riches that you that God has that he might strengthen you with power in your inner being we think way too much about scarcity and we don't understand of a God of abundance who's just wanting to see will we in faith trust him enough to be generous and so my New Year's resolution that is also my goal for 2016 is to make sure this is the most generous year ever for Scott Sager. Generous with my time, generous with my gifting, and generous with money. I'm going to test God and see. If I give more away, will you take care of us? If I see opportunities to bless people and I step into those, will you really show yourself faithful? And here's what I can tell you. Almost a month into this, God has not let us down yet. And I don't think he will. But it's an attitude of deciding to be generous and not to be all about, if I just had more, then I'd start being something that I'm not now. And so if you got the handout on the next page, God's ROI, God's return on investment, is there's a reward for those who are faithful with what he's given to us. And, um, you know, something interesting happened yesterday, and I haven't shared, you know, it happened on Thursday in class, and I haven't shared it with anybody but my wife. And I'd like to share it with you, and I'd like for you not to hear it as bragging because it's never happened before. Okay? But it was a pretty amazing thing. I was in class, and I, I teach the story of Jesus in the fall, and I teach the story of the church uh, in the spring. So I've got 40 students, the story of the church. It's going great. It's a very energetic class. And a girl named, uh, named Sinny, S-I-N-N-Y, from Hong Kong, China, she stayed after class. I had a lot of people I was talking to, and finally they all dispersed. And she said, Professor Sager, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. And I said, okay, what's, what's up? I knew she had just come, here from, just come here from Hong Kong two weeks ago. I said, well, what's, what's up? And she said, well, on the first day of class, you told us that your undergraduate degree was in business and that you're an entrepreneur at heart and you love to build things and you love to grow things and she looked up at me and she said I bet that if you had decided to go into business you'd have a whole lot more money than you have now and I just smiled and she said but I want you to know what you're doing in here is making an impact on people like me and I thought you'd want to know that yesterday because of what we talked about in class, I gave my life to Christ and I got baptized. And I was like, what? And she said, yeah, I did. And I just wanted you to know that what you're doing is making a difference. Well, here's what you need to know. I've been teaching this class for four years. And that's the first time anybody's come up to me and told me anything like that. But all I know to do is to just keep sowing seeds keep being generous keep loving people keep spending time keep stopping when you see people that you know on the campus and ask them how they're doing and and pour your life into people and you just never know when god will grant a harvest from what that happens but it's your responsibility to be a good steward of what you've been given to go next door and meet your neighbors to go next door when when the weather changes and make sure that the little old ladies pipes are wrapped and to make sure that there's something for them and to just be the person who cares not knowing what the results going to be but just because you can you do and that's what it means uh, to be this kind of person i got five minutes so let me close this down for you okay three options for investing your life the problem is not that you don't have enough time. The problem is not that you don't have enough gifting. And the problem is not that you don't have enough money. The question is, how will you use 
what God has given to you. And there's three options. You can waste what God has given to you, and you can waste your life. I don't think if you're here this morning that that's your challenge, okay? That's the story of the prodigal son who went away and took all of the abundance that the father had lavished upon him and blew it in things that don't matter, that won't last, and who perish. It's all going to burn up, and he put all of his resources into that. It's the other son who spends his life. That's option two. I can spend my life Think about the attitude of the older brother. All these years I've served you. I haven't neglected a single command, yet you have never even given me a small goat that I might be merry with my friends. And the father said, no, you don't get it. Everything I have was available to you if you had just decided to use it. The reason that you didn't have a party with your friends is because you didn't have a party with your friends. The resources were there. You just didn't step up. And that's the story of most of us. We're still trying to decide whether we're going to spend our life or we're going to invest our life, number three, for the kingdom. Invest our life for the kingdom. We're going to use the resources that have been given to us To put an investment in the only place that matters. And that is, are we putting an investment treasures in heaven? And the only way I know to do that is to invest in people. To invest your time, your talent, your resources in people. And to say, I will not lay up for myself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. I am going to lay up for myself treasures in heaven. I'm going to invest in people. And all of this lower scoreboard stuff, fine and dandy, but here's what I know. If I want an ultimate return upon my investment, I'm going to invest in people for the sake of the kingdom. And when you get to heaven, you'll be shocked at all God did with your few talents and his Holy Spirit. And so the challenge before us on page four, if you so choose, is to think about how to invest your life. What do you want to be known for? How do you want to use your time? How do you want to use your giftedness? How do you want to use your resources, your finances, and all that God's given to you? What do you want to be known for? The challenge this afternoon, sometime during this day, is to write it down. You will be 42% more likely for this lesson to impact you if you write anything down on page four. Talk about it and decide. How can we better invest what God has given to us? I read of a man who stood up to speak at the funeral of his friend. He referred to the days on his tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that the first came, the date of his birth, and spoke of the following date with tears, but he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For the dash represents all the time that he spent alive on the earth, and now only those who loved him know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we invest our dash. Heavenly Father, bless our time. And Lord, we pray as disciples that you will call us to invest our life in the things that matter most with the belief and the absolute assurance that you'll take our little and with your spirit do amazing beyond what we could ask or imagine. And we put that trust in you and we ask that you'd help us to be generous this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Dismissed? See you at 10 o'clock.